I will talk about uh, something that has been very exciting for me in the last few months. Uh, and it is the first time actually I'm talking about this uh, line of work. And uh, it is based on uh, Rod Nibis' work, uh, who is the first part of my talk is based on Rod Nibis' work, who is actually here today with us. Rod is a, a graduating PhD student in pharmacology. He works with Mark Chance. And then Selim is a junior student, junior PhD student in electrical engineering and computer science. And in the second part of my talk, I will talk about uh, his line of work, but they are all related to identification of coordinate dysregulated subnetworks in human colorectal cancer. Uh, so I think uh, I don't need to motivate uh, why we are studying human colorectal cancer to this crowd, but I will just mention that it is a complex and progressive disease. So single identifying single gene markers in terms of genes that are dysregulated in uh, tumorigenic or metastatic cell lines. Uh, single gene markers are inadequate and we want to identify multiple markers and we want to understand the interplay between those multiple markers so that we can do prognosis, we can do therapeutic intervention, etc. cetera. Uh, so, Differential network analysis has been around for a while. The general idea here is uh, we, we have protein-protein interaction data available to us, uh, human protein-protein interaction data, and it tells us, uh, not even mentioning the topology and etc. it at least tells us about who is related to whom in terms of their function. So if we can identify subnetworks, that is, uh, proteins that are connected to each other, which are also dysregulated when considered together, they might be good systems level markers for the phenotype, in our case, colon cancer. So uh, this is one uh, important work in this area that was published in 2007. This is by uh, Trey Eidecker's group at UC San Diego. Uh, so they proposed an idea where uh, these are, this is gene expression data, mRNA expression data, uh, the blue ones are uh, the control samples. Uh, the pink ones are the phenotype samples. Actually, they, they were uh, studying breast cancer metastasis, so they are the metastatic samples. And for each subnetwork, for a given subnetwork, where a subnetwork is defined as a connected subgraph of the protein-protein interaction network, they compute the activity of the subnetwork is an aggregate of the gene expression profiles of the proteins in, in that network. And then uh, using a mutual information, me, using, a mutual, uh, using an information theoretic measure uh, of class discrimination, which is mutual information in this case, uh, they are identifying subnetworks with high mutual information, which we call coordinate dysregulation. And they were able to show that these subnetworks, uh, when used as markers for classification, were much better than single gene markers. So our work is motivated by this type of work. But uh, in this talk, I will challenge existing approaches uh, in three perspectives. First of all, they use mRNA expression data. And actually, today, I think I am the first person who is talking about mRNA expression data. Everybody is talking about protein expression, uh, protein modifications, et cetera. Uh, so I will explain in detail why we don't like it in a second. Uh, second, uh, they are using additive formulation to represent the coordination between multiple proteins. Uh, and I will explain in the second part of my talk uh, why we don't like that. And finally, uh, they use greedy algorithms. And to explain why we don't like greedy algorithms, greedy algorithms are very useful in general. Greedy algorithms are algorithms, the, 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 the greedy algorithms are the least you can to do to solve a difficult problem. In the context of uh, subnetwork identification, a greedy algorithm simply searches the entire global network by seeding from a single gene and then 
based on uh, and then searching around that gene by adding genes that increase the objective function as much as possible. Here, the objective function is coordinate dysregulation. And we don't like grid algorithms here because by definition of the problem, we are looking for genes that together differentiate phenotype or control, phenotype and control. So we have to have something more algorithmically involved. So I will talk about two approaches. In the first approach, uh, we try to utilize biological insights by using other sources of experimental data. Uh, we try to use proteomic data to at least make a quick start for the search process. Second, I will talk about combinatorial formulation of coordinate dysregulation, which actually allows us to develop more sophisticated algorithms, which turn out to be actually quite effective in identifying subnetworks. So I think Eklesh uh, uh, Pandey already made the case for me for this slide. Uh, so actually, he was. Uh, talking about how inadequate interrogating at this level could be when understanding the dysregulation for in the phenotype, because really we are interested in this level. We are interested in the activation of molecules and et cetera. But in general, for the last 10 years in the bioinformatics community, the gold standard for measuring activity of molecules has been a mRNA expression. Why? Because it has genome-wide coverage. Okay, so most of the algorithms indeed use that source of data. Uh, but of course, transcriptomic data only provides a proxy to the dysregulation at the functional level. So the question is, although it has relatively lower coverage, can we somehow use proteomic data to actually make inferences beyond the scale of what the proteomic data tells us? And by proteomic data here, I mean protein expression data. Uh, so our approach uh, was actually you saw a simpler version of this slide uh, in the morning uh, in Mark's talk. Uh, so this is a generalized version of that slide, and the general idea is uh, we use proteomic screening uh, to the DIH to identify proteins uh, that are dysregulated uh, in tumor samples at the post-translational level. And we call these proteomic seeds. Then using the uh, global interactome, we search, uh, we score the proteins, the other proteins in the network to identify, uh, to identify proteins that exhibit significant crosstalk to the proteins that are identified to be dysregulated. I will uh, explain in a second how we define crosstalk. And then based on those significant crosstalkers, we construct subnetworks, and we hypothesize that these will be good candidates for being coordinately dysregulated subnetworks. So how do we find proteins that are functionally associated with proteomics. So you have a handful of proteins that are dysregulated, and you want to find the proteins that are in close proximity of them. Since the network is noisy, incomplete, etc., it's a good idea to use uh, something that is more robust uh, to false negatives, false positives, etc. So we use a random walk model where the idea is uh, you simulate a random walk on the network such that your random walk makes frequent restarts at the proteomic seeds and it goes until infinity. Then the crosstalk is defined as the relative amount of time you spend at each protein. So if a protein is in close proximity of the proteomic seeds, then it is likely to have a high crosstalk score. I would like to emphasize here that actually uh, we are looking for significance of the random walk-based scoring 
as opposed to the raw random weight walk based score. Uh, so as to account for uh, a certain bias in the network and also actually the bias in the proteomic data because uh, the proteomic seeds that are identified using 2D dyes are generally uh, biased towards, towards proteins that are abundant in the cell or you know, also there, there is the effect of uh, the molecular weight of proteins and other uh, electro physical properties. So we use significance based on a random model. So then, once we identify uh, the significant cross-talkers, for each proteomic seed, so the red protein here is the proteomic seed, uh, for each prote uh, proteomic seed, we construct a network. And in the network, the blue ones are those that are identified to be significant cross-talkers. The green ones are those that interact with a proteomic seed, but they do not exhibit significant crosstalk when all, this, all of the seeds are considered. So our hypothesis is that the blue ones will exhibit more significant coordinate dysregulation in colorectal cancer compared to the entire neighborhood of a proteomic seed. Uh, so we tested this idea uh, in uh, using uh, the 67 proteomic seeds that, that were identified uh, in a, a late, late stage cohort. And we used an independent gene expression data that was collected from independent patients. Uh, we obtained it from uh, the gene expression omnibus. And as you can see uh, here, the red diamonds are the coordinate dysregulation of cross-talker subnetworks, while the uh, green squares are the coordinate dysregulation of the subnetworks of interactors of the proteomic seeds. So in many cases, the red diamonds were the winner. There is no clear winner. In many cases, they are winner, but for most of the proteomic seeds, actually, there was no significance at all. But uh, in, I think, five or six subnetworks at least, we observed that the cross-talkers exhibited significant coordinate dysregulation. So to further illustrate that the cross-talkers are actually quite useful for making quick, quick starts, we tested these subnetworks in a classification framework. So here uh, we are identifying subnetworks and uh, training a classifier in one gene expression data set and we are trying to predict tumor in another data set. And as features, we are using the subnetworks. So the red and blue lines show a comparison of the uh, cross-talkers and interactors in the context of seeding the search for proteomic seeds. And as you can see, the first uh, two or three cross-talker subnetworks are extremely good for classification purposes, which means that their coordinate dysregulation is reproducible among different data sets. Uh, the interactor subnetworks catch up after a while, but you have to include a lot of more subnetworks. The CAN cross-talkers and CAN interactors are there for control purposes. Uh, they are actually the they are found by applying the same idea to known driver genes of colon cancer. So again, we consider the known driver genes as, the, uh, as our seeds, and then we identify the cross-talkers and interactors similarly. And as you can see, actually, uh, the cross-talkers of the driver genes provide quite good performance in classification. But uh, the proteomic seeds do not do any worse either. OK, so uh, we further experimentally validated this approach uh, by identifying uh, some proteins that were identified as significant cross-talkers with proteomic seeds, and also that were in the subnetworks that were coordinately dysregulated. So uh, we predicted that uh, these proteins, these particular proteins, will also exhibit significant post-translational dysregulation. And indeed, uh, the Western blood showed that actually 
uh, they are dysregulated more significantly at the protein level compared to the mRNA level. So this is about uh, the proteomics-driven approach. Now uh, I would like to talk about uh, an algorithmic approach to improving open grid. So here uh, we are trying to formulate the coordination between multiple proteins with respect to, in, in the context of this regulation with respect to cancer. And the traditional definition is you compute the subnetwork activity by taking an average of the expression levels of the genes in the subnetwork, and then uh, you look at the mutual information between the expression and phenotype. The problem here is this definition is only valid if everybody is dysregulated in, this, in the same, same direction, right? If all genes in the subnetwork are upregulated, then this particular vector will provide a good signal for you. But say, if these genes interact with each other in more complex, in more sophisticated ways, and different combinations of these genes are actually indicative of different phenotypic outcomes, then there is no way you can identify uh, such patterns, complicated patterns, with this kind of additive approaches. So here is an example, actually. Let me first show you the example. So this is a hypothetical example. So consider this subnetwork. Here, uh, the green and uh, red squares show the expression level of each gene. And as you can see here, the, in the phenotype samples, either gene 1 and gene 2 are expressed, or gene 2 and gene 4 are expressed. While in control samples, either gene 1 and gene 3 are expressed, or gene 2 and gene 4 are expressed. We don't know whether the, this situation really occurs. But if such a situation occurs, then it, by additively formulating the coordination between these genes, we are simply uh, adding up the effects, which all become zero, and actually the subnetwork activity in phenotype and control samples is just the same. Okay, so we have to look at combinatorial uh, coordinate dysregulation. So we developed this uh, algorithm called uh, Crane. And the idea behind Crane is, instead of looking at subnetwork activity, look at subnetwork state, define subnetwork state as a random variable by properly quantizing the expression levels, and then uh, compute uh, combinatorial coordinate dysregulation is the mutual information between subnetwork state and the phenotype. So the good thing about this formulation is actually uh, the problem is still intractable. So you still need some easy algorithm to deal with, to deal with it. But if we decompose the objective function, if we decompose our formulation for combinatorial coordinate dysregulation into components for each possible state, so instead of looking for uh, instead of looking for subnetworks with high combinatorial coordinate dysregulation, if we look for subnetwork states that are indicative of phenotype, then actually we can bound the information provided by a large subnetwork state in terms of statistics about a smaller state. Which means that from an algorithmic pers perspective, which means that actually you can exhaustively search in the network for subnetworks by just using this bound and making early st stops whenever necessary. You are exhaustive, but since you have a good bound, 
you are actually doing that exhaustive search by pruning out the search space much more effectively. So we went ahead and implemented this, and we identified subnetworks, but uh, in the classification framework again. Uh, the classification framework is, usually, is a useful setup for comparing the quality of or the reprodu reproducibility of the subnetworks that are identified. But one problem uh, with the combinatorial approach is uh, since we are really trying to capture the combinatorial relationships in the dysregulation of different genes, uh, now when we will use these subnetworks as features, we can't simply add their expression levels up and use them as features. That's why, that's what we were against. So instead of doing that, we uh, use neural networks. Uh, we identify subnetworks, and each subnetwork becomes actually an input layer neuron. And then uh, using uh, possibly negative weight functions and also nonlinear uh, functions, we train neurons. So when we implemented this uh, classification framework, the results were quite surprising. Surprising in the sense that we were not unhappy. It was, they were surprisingly good. So the red shows the classification performance of our framework. And this is in the context of uh, prediction of metastasis, which is a much harder problem compared to classifying tumor versus normal. So in the context of colon cancer metastasis, as you can see, the, only the two, sub, the two top subnetworks identified by our algorithm can actually provide 100% performance. And compare this with single gene markers. The single gene markers are the blue ones. It's the blue line, on the, it, the, the blue line at the bottom. It's really the best it can go is around 60%. Okay, so Compared to random, it can only improve the performance 20%. Uh, then, uh, as a control for uh, exhaustive algorithms versus greedy algorithms, we also implemented a greedy algorithm that tries to maximize combinatorial coordinate dysregulation. Okay, but it doesn't do it exhaustively, it does it greedily. And it doesn't even perform as good as uh, the additive algorithm. So, this is the algorithm that was developed by Eidecker's group. Okay. So clearly, if we look for states, uh, at least we deliver almost perfect classification performance. So those states are there, and they mean something. Uh, so actually, when we looked at the five uh, subnetworks that were ranked highest uh, in our search uh, for colon cancer metastasis. Uh, and then uh, we, we looked at the enrichment of uh, these subnetworks in the transcription network because uh, eventually we are using the gene expression data, mRNA level expression data. So these subnetworks have to be dysregulated at the transcriptional level. So what we found is actually uh, is there were 17 genes in the top five subnetworks, and uh, six of them. Uh, are direct regulators, or they are regulated by a very well-known uh, proto-oncogene, uh, CMIG. And uh, it, is, it, is, it is known to be a target of the APC signaling pathway, which is known to be disrupted uh, in tumorigenic cell lines. So the conclusions that I would like to make is, first, information theoretic formulation is quite useful. Uh, second, uh, the other sources of data besides mRNA expression can provide useful shortcuts for searching for subnetworks. Third, cellular states, considering cellular states, looks more useful than just superposing uh, the molecular activity of multiple molecules. Uh, then choice of algorithms matters. So in biological applications, generally greedy algorithms are sufficient. They provide us enough insights. But in this context, it, it looks like actually algorithmic sophistication matters. And uh, finally, actually, this combinatorial representation and the existence of these differentiating states 
tells us that we can uh, develop novel, novel modern paradigms for cellular signaling, which will be useful to discreetly represent uh, what is going on uh, during cancer or etc. So this com uh, completes my discussion. I would like to thank uh, Selim Rad and Mark uh, for this great work. And I would also like to mention Sinan and Gökhan, who are also uh, my PhD students. Ted and Alex are working with us. Uh, they are undergraduate students, actually, but they are doing a great work uh, with uh, Rab and I. Uh, and I would also uh, like to mention the contribution of uh, Vishal and Gurkan from the Proteomics Center uh, and Tom Laframbo is from Genetics. Uh, thank you very much, and I will be able to answer your questions. I wanted to ask you if you compared your method with uh, gene set enrichment analysis where they use a Kalmogora Smirnov like test statistic. I think they try to use that method to address the fact that pathway can be upregulated by having genes downregulated and upregulated. So it sort of uh, addresses the greediness, uh, I mean the greedy algorithms. Have you tried to compare and see whether that algorithm uh, performs as well? Or? No, I should, I should, we should look at it together and compare it probably. I, I don't know about it, so it, it might be something that I already know of, but you know, just in case, we, I think we should talk about it. My one question is about overfitting in those cases, and actually the results that you're presenting, were they generated using some cross-validation, or are they just training? Oh, they are all cross-validation. So in all of the classifications, the experiments here, uh, the subnetwork identification and training is done in one data set, and testing is done in another data set. So we don't even do leave one out. We, we simply do cross-validation, totally on different data sets. Uh, in terms of the uh, di number of dimensions and the, the limitations of number of samples, that's an excellent question. And uh, if you have noticed, actually, uh, the number of subnetworks that we use, uh, when the sub number of subnetworks, subnetwork features that we use is small, then we get best performance in general. And I think it's exactly because of what you mentioned. So as the number of subnetworks grows, the number of uh, the, the number of parameters that you have to uh, optimize grows, uh, but the number of dimensions is limited by the number of samples. So that is why actually the performance drops as you keep adding subnetworks. But if you are in the regime of a few subnetworks, then you are fine. Where the network data come from and what kind of information is it? So in all these experiments, we, we used uh, binary protein-protein interaction data from HPRD. So actually, HPRD provides uh, binary interaction data. They are in, either in vitro, in vivo, or Y2H. Uh, we take them. We also take the protein complex data uh, from HPRD. We use the matrix model. So we put an interaction between any protein, any pair of proteins in the complex, this is all HPRD. Uh, 